so happy to be here and I will read uh, the poems from Broken Blush and then I'm going to, I hope, say a few words about these uh, wonderful poets that are gathered here for this to, you know, that, that, whose work we're celebrating tonight. So um, I am still just thrilled to see this, this beautiful book and um, so I will read. This is Broken Blush. It's five, five prose poems. Okay, so I have to figure out how this book works. <laughs> <laughs> and this is actually for Nicolas Guillen, Alejandro Pizarnik, Nancy Morejon, and Pablo Nebula, whose um, gestures and mannerisms, I think, are somehow behind these poems. Uh, the subject matter, definitely has to do with what I'm thinking about these days, but um, some of their emotion, I think, may be also present. So this is Ant Antarctica. Oh, I know, because um, I read a story, this is a news story about a scheme to, um, to round up polar bears from the North Pole and move them to Antarctica where they might thrive better. So that's the solution, right? Antarctica, your coolness thaws this lowly cloud, the superficial Earth's unbuckled equator. You steep the bliss of Arctic mammals in congealing arteries of barren ice. You throw the brakes on ancient glaciers to hone the polar bear's survival skills. You've become a colorless target, unable to mend a mortal wound. This is Devil's Ashtray. Uh, and I was trying to remember, where did this come from? And I think it came from a poem by Alejandro Pizarro that was called God's Chandelier. <laughs> and somehow that became devil's ashtray. <laughs> Who empties the devil's ashtray? Who in hell is laundering his dirty shirts? Whose job is it to lick the devil's pots and polish his spittoons? Would you believe it? Some are paid to do his work while others volunteer. <laughs> this is not dead yet. You hate missing nothing, not ignorant eyes of potato, clean air, clear lungs, or white gloves poised for inspection. Yet you skip bits of plankton that swim in infinite acres of ice cubes. So you miss the genie escaping like Houdini, or the only locust in a field of hybrid corn. You favor dry basements, sharp pencils, and a tame patch of earth that looks rather flat. This is immaterial. Your nebula loiters with none of a father's abandonment, blotting out stars. Dark holes in heaven stand still. Oh, to be brilliantly agitated while swallowing somber dusk. Yes, you, your famished bones plunged into doldrums, your slight skin never anesthetized. We wait serenely as large black triangles <coughs> betray immeasurable time. Forever adrift, you are mutable as blandness turning vivid. Surely in the infinity of a single grain, you keep your balance, leaning away from specks of mass matter you never were. You merge with a gas giant, a stable, unique blob stitched together from whole cloth, an unspoken image from the sunken depth of unknown dimensions. <coughs> and this is 
the last one, but it really was the first one, Broken, broken Glitch. Finding myself in the desert, I planted a luminous seed. I let go a howl past moist teeth, certain it couldn't have been the mute sunshine laughing, a sane cello, or a brand new brain. No one came near, nor was I ever shallow or newsworthy to you, as the moon has revealed. Only a murmur blasted by brief springs, by the dry, impenetrable glare of a taproot. I fell asleep on rational sand dunes, where the cactus rasped above my toenails, a solid stench descending from oblivion. Slowly, unlike the spines I was stuck with, I spoke calmly, addressing the watery ocean I discovered in my dotage and I went on undeterred, healed by that unwavering stink. <laughs> so that was <laughs> so I had the pleasure um, of um, receiving a large box filled with poetry I could not have done this at all without the help of these people who, um, you know, Sharon and Sarah and Alex and all of these people who um, actually uh, kept sending me little reminders <laughs> at various times. And um, so I'm very, very, very pleased with the results. There was so much good poetry in this box. It was so difficult to choose. Um, but, you know, I also thought that these poets, in a way, were talking among themselves. You know, that uh, partly why these particular works were chosen was because of what I thought was an affinity that they had. That they were using, they were, in a way, interlocking worlds within worlds, that um, there were um, there were explorations of works within popular culture. I want to just mention, um, let's see, this is the order, the order is, okay, it's going to be Joshua Crea will read, then Sheila Carter-Jones, then Alexandra Regalado, uh, and those three are the honorable mentions. And, um, and then Sandra Beasley will read her book, has, uh, her chapbook is um, okay. the winner of the winners, okay? Of, of, of these many winners, okay? So, um, so Joshua Crea with um, Holy Ghost so awesome. People um, is writing about, well, so many things. But there is a, um, he has actually spoken in some places about the desire to know what the poem can speak beyond what the poet wants to say. And, um, and to allow the poem to, um, to push beyond boundaries that the poet might set for the poem. And I found that to be a very inspiring idea to think about for myself, even in my own work. Um, and and the, the idea of appropriation of the, the words, the voices, the language of others, and how we share language, and how language becomes inspirited uh, in terms of our inspiration, but also in terms of the soul. What is the soul of the word? What is the soul of language? Those were ideas that I thought about in reading his work. Um, with Sheila, and you know, there's an idea of scripture in his work as well, as in holy scripture, but also in the idea of writing itself as something that's so basically human, or I think of it that way. Sheila Carter Jones, her work, um, Crooked Star Dream Book, um, and I recognize the genre of the dream book and how the genre of the dream book, which is itself a form of literature, you could say, is incorporated into this very personal family saga 
and, um, and how there was a conversation between the dream book and this personal story that was very interesting to me, and how the dream book as a piece of popular culture and its own kind of scripture was um, being um, appropriated for this poetry. That was something that really interested me. And then with Alexander Regalado, La Locaria, uh, and I was familiar a little bit from growing up in Texas with the Locaria cards and those beautiful images um, and how again that's another kind of popular culture artifact, another form that is being appropriated by the poet to tell another kind of story, uh, a story of a culture within a culture perhaps. Um, I think of it as kind of like a bingo game and, um, and the, 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 little, the little drawings become vivid characters you know, within the poetry itself. So that was very exciting to me as well. And then I want to speak a little bit about um, Sandra Beasley, um, who's going to read last. Um, her work, um, None in the Same Room, uh, which uh, appropriates a very peculiar little book that I had never heard of. But I was very fascinated with the idea that this person wrote this particular book. You may want to say more about it. but. Um, it's a very strange little book. And, uh, <laughs> the book that she's using as her jumping off point is a very strange little book. And she recognized the strangest, strangeness of it, and she met it with her own strangeness, which is very poetic form of strangeness, right? But she saw the potential for poetry in this, this book, which is about communication with people that you don't see, right? So, um, so all of them, I thought, were in a certain way on a wavelength, you know, uh, having these conversations with these other works and other people's words and making them their own. So I was very, very happy to see all of them come together tonight. And thank you very much.